Well, good to be back, getting back into the Word. Um, next couple of weeks, so we're sort of in a little home stretch here in the book of Hebrews, and then we'll be branching into or moving into the book of the Revelation uh, coming up towards the end of the month. A lot of good things going on. We're expecting, uh, you know, so here, just give you a little snapshot. My wife and I, my family, uh, came here in 2016 uh, to pastor this church, started that process in the fall of 2015. Uh, by January 1st of 2016, we were uh, moving towards becoming full-time, and that officially took place in uh, 20, um, in t- t- the spring of 2016. And so here we are. We just started, I believe, our eighth year, and I'm um, hoping in the next two years, within the next two years, we are meeting on the other property permanently so hitting around that 10-year mark now we're we're not waiting for that if we can be there sooner uh, but it is exciting to see what's coming up we have a meeting with our architect on Tuesday which I'm so excited about uh, talk about the next steps for building design um, we're waiting on a quote for some land clearing that is necessary to make those uh, important next steps engineering which is how you flush your toilets and park your cars and all that stuff and all that stuff needs to happen as part of this operation, and, uh, but we've got some great people in this process that, um, you know, you, sometimes you don't realize the, the process is a series of steps, and sometimes you lose sight of the steps you need to take, or you forget, like, wow, look what, look what we've already been able to do, and I certainly say I believe what God has enabled us to do, and we don't want to miss a beat, and I think these next couple weeks wrapping up uh, the book of Hebrews is incredible. Um, motivation for us to keep strong as we serve the Lord. Uh, Faith, hope, and love is the finale of the last three chapters of the book of Hebrews. There is both strong emphasis on example, expectation, and exhortation to have a successful completion living your life for Jesus Christ. I like the way J. Vernon McGee points out in his Hebrews through the Bible commentary, that old rugged voice that you can hear I'm just speaking through those pages of the commentary. You guys know it, right? Uh, Faithful Bible teacher. Uh, Anyway, he says that Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 12 is the hope chapter. And Hebrews chapter 13 is the love chapter. And you'll recall in 1 Corinthians 13, that great descriptive anthem of God's love concludes with this. And now abide faith, hope, and love these three but the greatest of these is love so we're going to look at that next sunday um i appreciate your offer trevor to help preach today um i was in this um feeling this somewhat compelled i'm like i I just want to finish the book of hebrews over these next two weeks and we've got a funeral later today Um, as you guys know uh, my dad's dear friend of 40 years uh, passed away at the end of december so i've got that funeral this afternoon certainly would appreciate your prayers, but I thought, you know what, I, in, in um, preparing to be with you today, caused so many awesome thoughts that were birthed out of Hebrews chapter 12, and I would like to pass some of those on to you. Uh, hopefully, we'll stick right with the scripture. When these three are developed, faith, hope, and love, um, our lives uh, really can start to reflect the whole purpose and mission when, when the Apostle Paul says that he was praying that Christ would be formed in us. Jesus Christ is the picture of perfect faith. Yes, he is completely sinless, but he's totally human. He's God in human flesh, and yet he, he accomplishes when he comes into Jerusalem, when he, he knows he's going to die on the cross, he set his eyes steadfastly toward Jerusalem because he knew that that was the whole purpose. He came. I'm going to die for sinners. My life is going to pay the debt in full for sinners. And you know what's so awesome is that our Lord is the king of multitasking. Uh, he can be suffering upon a cross, but at the same time have the whole entire world held together. This is our Jesus who we serve. This is the Lord in which we love, and this is the Lord that we want to continue um, in our devotion to. Some of you remember the, this past week. Let me just 
bring this up here. Oh, do that, okay. Uh, D- Damar Hamlin's heart-stopping moment is the proof that can turn an entire NFL stadium into a prayer meeting, regardless what the Supreme Court says. If they say it's okay. Remember this moment? Some of us recall, I um, was taken in by this as well, and certainly that's a powerful picture right there. Again, is every one of those a lover of Jesus Christ? I don't know, and it's not a big deal in my mind, but I'll tell you, that was a moment in which captured my attention. And it brings me to the place of knowing that prayers for Damar Hamlin have been answered. Damar is, was in serious, critical, life, a life-ending decision time. And that moment captured in that stadium and all the cameras across America Our hearts were captured by this moment. Guess what this shows us? The brevity of life. Life can be over. I know these guys play a hard game and football's a rough sport, right? We get that. At the same time, you're not expecting to die in the field, okay? Um, I know a lot of, I've heard a lot of the uh, rumblings within the NFL, you know, community and the sports community that's kind of scary now. It's like, am I next? Well, you and I should have the full, full confidence that If our moment is next, are you going to be with Jesus? You can be 1,000% sure on the authority of the Word of God. And Jesus is proof that that um, that's why He came. Christ wants us with Him forever. His desire is not to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. But that is in the book, that is in the record of Scripture, that there are those He will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. See why? Because Jesus knows those who trusted Him. And um, anyway, I, so this idea of this stadium moment kind of fits right into uh, Hebrews chapter 12. There's a Wall Street Journal opinion piece that I appreciated reading. Um, and I'll just, just kind of go to there and then, you know, kind of tie this into where we're going. In the Wall Street Journal piece that was on January 5th, the article was titled, How Damar Hamlin Drove a Nation to Pray. Damar asked his doctor, did, he, did we win the game? And the doctor said, you won the game of life. And now we pray that Damar's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life with, the, with true faith in Jesus. And that's my hope for Damar Hamlin. That's my prayer for him, that he would know with all that prayer was powerfully answered by Almighty God on his behalf. But let's now pray that Damar would come. And if he doesn't already, pray he does. Pray Damar knows Jesus. That's the most important thing the Bible says, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even those who on earth said, I don't really want to worship him. Not a good decision. Um, because with Christ is life. You know, it's like what Paul says, Christ in me, the, the hope of glory. See, when Christ is in your life, it's a game changer. Literally, it is a game changer. Uh, because there's so much in us that is already in uh, problem status, okay? Uh, that's a sin problem that has to be taken away. And Jesus did that when he shed his own blood on that cross for us. And we who trust him, that payment is waiting to be received. And the moment you receive that payment, God says, oh, you're washed as white as snow. You may still get impacted by this filthy world. And we all do. We all know that. It's very real. Like I still interact with a filthy world. And sometimes a bad, scripture says bad company corrupts good morals. And let me say it this way. If you want to start and finish your Christian life well-pleasing to God, understand the book of Hebrews. It will keep you from a poorly lived Christian life. You and I are running the race that the Lord has set for us, and he wants you going for that heavenly prize, which I believe is knowing Jesus. Paul says, I want to know him. And that's possible for you and for me. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to know Jesus. So I'm like, well, pastor, it's like really hard. I get it. It's, I understand. It is hard. There, is, there are steps that you and I will take in this life that will be different than what we were before we were saved. Um, the way you might start to think differently. Like, oh, like, that was a broken way of thinking. Like, where did that broken way of thinking come from? That is a principal factor that resides in each of us that we all just want to do it our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray, right? But the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all, stated hundreds of years before Christ Jesus died upon that cross. And now Christ, and now when we understand what he's done for us and we come into this wonderful opportunity to trust him and walk with him, he's with us. He's with you to the very end, says Jesus. That's awesome. That's so wonderful that you can just know that he's never going to leave me. 
I may be the, ne- the, next, the, the next Damar Hamlin. Pray not, but if I am, and I was not to get my heart beat back, okay, maybe I don't have the defibrillator and all the people and all that, all that excellent medical care that, those, that he got on the, on the f- field and all those answers to prayer. The Bible says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And that's our hope. That's, high, that's why we can sing the songs we just sang, the lion and the lamb, right? You know, if God is for us, who could be against us? All those wonderful truths that we just sang about, that is birthed in this incredible book, in this credible uh, purpose, the way God wants us to know him and love him and trust him. And that's what we're going for this morning. I pray that we are going to get there with an incredible, uh, improved perspective of what God has for you in this book of the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The picture is this amphitheater. Now, I love what some of the commentators write, and you certainly as a pastor and as you grow, you're like, you know what? That seems like a good idea, but that may not be exactly what the Bible says. And I love when a, when a uh, Bible commentator who's a trusted Bible teacher says, I used to think about this text and I had it wrong. Anyway, it's an image here. It's a picture. It's an illustration where this chapter opens up with this idea that we are now surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, where did that all come from? That came from the previous chapter, chapter 11, right? That wonderful faith chapter is that these Old Testament saints, these the, those who were alive before Jesus was on the earth, they waited for what God promised in his word. And they served God in, in light of that promise. But they still died. Some of them were sawn in two. Some of them were persecuted. Some of them paid a dear price for believing God. And yet God rewarded them. He says, you guys are genius. My, my system of calling you righteous is the same way as for those of the Old Testament and those of the, of the New Testament. The righteous one will live by faith. When you take the word of God and you believe the God of the Bible and you believe of who he says he is and all that he's promised and you put your trust in him, God sees that faith. Isn't that awesome? God sees faith. God sees when you are believing him. Now, you may have a lapse of faith. I've got him periodically. Like, okay, you know, sometimes life is just downright hard, right? You get that, right? We all get that. Like, life is hard. Just because your life is hard and you have a moment of, God, where are you? That's not like you, you didn't crash and burn there. It's, it's not like it's all over. It's just that you're weak. And the scripture says, if you really want to stay strong in the way that you should stay strong, Take the lessons from Hebrews chapter 12. So this idea is that this amphitheater of Old Testament saints are surrounding these New Testament saints. Now, I fully believe that the people of heaven, the people that have lived before us, died and went to heaven, then are occupied with what's going on here on earth. I don't think God was, it's like they got far more to anticipate knowing and they're in the presence of Jesus Christ. But we have their incredible, their witness for us. Like, wow. These people serve God. And now they are enjoying Christ Jesus and his full presence. Hebrews takes the holy examples from the past and tells the believer, learn from them and how to even go further. I want to go further. I don't want to just, because I have so much to go on now. You and I have so much to go on. The title of the message is How to Keep Singing Clearly. Sometimes our focus needs to be adjusted in this book, I really believe, is, or this chapter is the, one of the very best ways that you and I can re- see the intricacy of how God says, this is what to do and this is what not to do. People say, I don't know how to live the Christian life. Well, you know why? Because the Christian life takes effort. The Christian life takes diligence. The, the Christian life takes an intentionality that if it just, it's not just magically. Think about you, okay? Did you just like magically get good at your job, Eric? Become a magically great accountant. In your case, you're a brainiac, okay? We know that. But Eric's an incredible accountant. He knows numbers, but he's gotten better over the years. He's, he's learned things. He's gone to, you know, he's got educated. He's got some of the stuff that good accountants get, you know, and they learn and then they practice and they, and they work on that every day. Christianity, in many ways, is a relationship that you and I get to practice. We get to do it. We get better at it. You want to tell people about Jesus? Well, learn how to do that. Uh, Aaron's in the back and he says he'd love to teach people how to share their faith. So we're looking at the right time to open up the Sunday school classroom, maybe for a time of teaching. Trevor wants to teach. So we've got, we got opportunities in our church that we want to create places where people could, could grow and, and develop in their, no, in their knowledge. But this doesn't just, your Christian life just doesn't happen magically. I'm not saying Christ isn't in your life. If you called upon Jesus, I don't know when you did that, but I'm telling you, Christ is in your life. But now, 
You want to go for it. You want to, you want to develop it. You want to become the best at what you can be for Jesus. Because if you got Christ in you, you got everything. All right? Amen? Okay, let's read the chapter. We're going to read all these verses. Oop. Sliding iPad. Okay, here we go. Therefore, we also, and these are going to be up on the screen, so you can just, if you have your Bible, you can certainly open it to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from the New King James Version, uh, but all of these verses should go up behind me. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted to, to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was reject, rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that, and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so, much as beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shall shook the earth, but now he is promising yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Wow. That is an incredible amount of uh, 
just developed thought of Scripture all in one shot. And it shows us who we're up against. And this can be sometimes, the book of Hebrews for a lot of, sometimes I, I wanted to say it this way. Anytime you read in Scripture where it's like, oh, like that just makes me like really uncomfortable, good. <laughs> kind of, I say that lovingly. I'm not trying to say anything that is scary. But sometimes we got to interact with the scary, uh, interact with those things because it causes us to go deeper. Um, sometimes Satan is masterful at using fear to keep you held hostage to, a, to, to that fear. And so you don't go further. And so, you know, I've known people in my life, it's like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Like, well, you got to talk about it. Like, you can't escape this thing. You and I are on a scheduled appointment with God. We can get there successfully. We can get there with just such a, an incredible reception by him. And at the same time, I want to make this 100% clear that where this scripture says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord, that is salvation that came to you through Jesus. That is the reason you are safe as a believer in Jesus Christ, that you have the security. Now, the thing that gets sorted out, and I've referenced this many times, is the life and what we did with our knowledge and our understanding of Christ in me. Like, what, God, how did, I, how did I live that out? That's going to get dealt with at a place called the judgment seat of Christ. That's where you and I will be. Um, our, our, I believe that's our private evaluation meeting with Jesus. And that day's coming for all of us. And that doesn't have to be a day. It's like, ah, uh, you know, it can be that. But at the same time, God wants to reward you. Jesus say, says, I'm coming and my reward is with me. Sometimes what we have to remember is that if we are struggling in a certain area and you realize I keep doing the same old, same old, and this is like, I'm feeling broken over this thing. That's an, a perfect opportunity for you to say, Jesus, help me. I'm, un I'm uncomfortable with this thing going on inside of me. Every time this type of thing happens, this is how I always react. Every time. Like, do you ever have those moments? No, not, not ever. Okay. Okay. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like, all of a sudden it's like, okay, as soon as you get stressed, you run to the refrigerator. Like, okay, this isn't working. All right, why? Because you got something going on inside of you that's causing that to like the, that fear, that whatever, that anxiety. And all of a sudden, like that's a perfect place for like these moments that we see that are sometimes like hard for us to face. Those are moments that you have the invitation at that time to bring it right to Jesus, Lord. And it might just be like, turn around, get away from the refrigerator and go in your living room or go someplace private, take a ride, go to the beach, go somewhere and just pour out your heart to God and say, this is what's really going on inside of me. You know, he's going to tell you, you know what? I know all about you. I know who I took on. And I love you in the intimacy that now you can develop instead of you just, you know what? Where scripture says in this passage, don't refuse him. That's what he's talking about here. Don't refuse this grace. You know, I mean, people are trying to like do life their own way, do it their own version. It's like, I'm going to just get it my, I'm going to get there. I'll do it. I'm, I'm the king. No, you're not. <laughs> just saying. You're not the king. There's one king. He's the true king. You might think you're king for a while. Most kings fall off their horse eventually, right? Jesus is never going to fall off his horse. Oh, I, I love this story. I read a book a number of years ago. I um, can't even remember the title, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to get the author's name right. Anyway, his guy's name was Jeremy. Jeremy tells his story, um, and he's, he's talking about what it really looks like to be a servant, and he learned that he'd go he he thought this he thought he was like you know the cat's meow cat lovers you, you appreciate that you know so he's thinking um you know if i get if i can you know he's developing in his christian life and he wants to go be a speaker and then he gets to this opportunity where you know the, he gets hooked up with this trainer this wonderful speaker who's going to speak to a lot of people and that on a certain evening well jeremy gets to go with them and um jeremy gets there and the guy's setting up uh, chairs in the auditorium for that night. This is, the, this is the keynote speaker. He's helping to set up chairs. Jeremy's like, he's thinking, I want to hang out with this guy. I, like, I want this guy to teach me stuff. And then later that day, um, he's, he sees other, guy, other like, qualities of character in this man where he's just following this, like, he's following this guy around, but it, 
He's not teaching him anything about how to be a good orator, a good communicator. He just wants to, Jeremy just wants the platform. He just wants to speak. He just wants the, he wants the limelight. He wants the place to do this thing. And, and he's just not getting it. And at one point, um, Jeremy tells a story, and I'm going to go back to that story in a moment. Jeremy has this uh, moment in his life where he has this dream. And, and I'm not sure like the exact order, but anyway, Jeremy has this dream one night. And he's in a football stadium, if we can use the same image here today. He's in a football stadium, and he's on a white horse. And he is just feeling like, so good, like, I'm on this horse. And there's another one coming on a white horse. And he's coming towards Jeremy, and he stops. And Jeremy realizes it's Jesus And Jesus says to Jeremy in that dream, he says, Jeremy, please get off my horse. (laughs) Anyway, so Jeremy had these moments of really learning of what it means to serve. And sometimes in our life, we don't we don't realize like we don't realize the pathway that we're we think we're on. Like I'm all about this and this is my life and I'm going to do it this way. You know, the scripture tells us that we shouldn't even speak that way. If the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. If God wants me to do that, you know, that's why, that's a, that's a way of holy thinking. I'm in God's hands, and I want to do what God wants me to do. Anyway, back to Jeremy for just a second. At that, so one of those moments where he was getting ready to, the, the gentleman went out and was getting ready to speak. Jeremy went into the men's room, and he's like, my goodness, these people are dirty, they're filthy, they're like, there's paper towels everywhere. And before Jeremy leaves the bathroom, he says, hey, Jeremy, I want you to clean the bathroom. And Jeremy says he learned things that were so, so important for him to learn about what does it really mean to submit to authority. And that's one of the hardest places. And that's why I believe Hebrews is a challenging book for a lot of us because it's like it's submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's like I want, I want him to be in charge of my life. And sometimes it's a battle and sometimes I say for some of you newbies here and some of you people are still trying to think and understand biblical Christianity and it's, it might be just something you're, you're not quite sure about. Like, how does this, Pastor, how does this all get processed in my life? Well, I'm telling you that one of the best things that you can do is get yourself starting to read the scripture and getting with somebody who could teach you just a little bit. Like, let's just get together. Let's figure this out together. There are people in this church who would be glad to spend time with you. Men spending time with men, women spending time with women, and will and we'll help you get the, the framework of what does it really mean. Make sure that you understand salvation, that you're saved. You know what? I, I, I have asked Jesus to save me. I, I'm, I'm just trusting him. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to jump through hoops. I just believe he loves me. He died for me, and I received that gift. Awesome. That's awesome, and that, and that happened. But then that growth process happens, and by the time you get to, say, a chapter in Hebrews chapter 12, you want to kind of get like, okay, well, how do, I, how do I develop further? And those three points here, we're just gonna cover them briefly before we take the Lord's Supper. Supper. A big theme of seeing clearly is you and I need to remember who suffered for us. Jesus Christ suffered for us. One of the things that happens in our life is that we take our eyes off of Christ mainly that our needs are so great that we remember the love that he showed for us and that's remembering that he suffered for us and he went all the way he went all the way to the cross for us he didn't leave one thing undone he says it's finished yeah it's finished in other words perfect redemption is secured for everyone come on in come on in jew Come on in. Gentile, come on in. I know you Jewish people, you nailed me to the cross. He knows that. The leadership did that. Jesus is going to deal with that. And by the end of this chapter, he's talking about what's coming for the future. Number two, how do you keep seeing clearly? By staying in the grace of God. You stay in this marvelous grace. You don't ever get away from it. It's your, it's your go-to. It's my go-to place. And this is so awesome because... It, just because you have some measure of success in your Christian life, you still need the grace of God work, working in you all the time to keep you from developing pride, arrogance, self-sufficiency. I mean, the whole list is there. They're all there. They're all the things that just want to come back and rule our life. 
doesn't mean that God doesn't want to use you. You should still be doing everything you do for the glory of God. Do it with all your heart. Scripture says do it with all your heart, soul, mind, and So it's not just being passive. Okay, now I'm just the passive person. You're not, no, that's not who you are. You're the, you're the person who's now being used by God to do what he wants you to do. It's so good. Sometimes I get phone calls by people. It's like, hey, just thinking of you. Or I just get a text message. I'm like, you know what? It took them time to even do that. Like out of the blue, they send me a text. Hey, just thinking of you, praying for you. Like, think about your busy day. How many times do you take the time just to say, you know what, I'm just thinking about you and I just want to shoot you a text. I want to tell you, I appreciate you. I love you. You're the best. You, you mean so much to me. Like we're go, 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 this, that. And it's like, you know what? So ask, this is where the Holy Spirit really creates win-wins for us because they get blessed and you get encouraged. Scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so when you start to think about, you know, you, you want to you keep people in the grace of God, learn how to encourage, learn how to love on them as fellow believers. And don't, don't just reserve this only for the believers. Sometimes you need to bless a non-Christian and bless them hugely. Like wake them up to the grace of God. You could just say something like that. You know what? God's blessed me so much that I just wanted you to have just a little piece of like what he's given to me. And I just, I just wanted to do that for you. And then you hear stuff like this. No one's like ever done this for me. Okay, now you've got an open door, right? You want to you be wise. And we want to be really good at creating opportunities for Christ to get glorified. Amen? That's, that's just, so it seems to me it's just like it's, 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 the, right, it's the right way. To, and, and then by anticipating our secure future, let's just go through a series of these verses and then we're going to wrap it up and we're going to pray and we're going to go into the Lord's table. There's a lot of, lot of correction going on in this particular chapter. Uh, but the big one is don't forget who already suffered for us and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author. He's the perfecter of our faith. Jesus does not grow tiring in perfecting you to maturity. He wants you to grow. That is his 24-7 eternal mission is to make you like himself. The Bible says he's conforming you. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it, even when you're sleeping. <laughs> okay. I want to wake up and be like, another day. I'm under construction. God's got good purposes for me. I don't want to lose sight of them. Scripture says here in verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Anytime you're discouraged, someone's beating you up, whatever, verbally, or you're just beating yourself up, just remember, Christ Jesus, he already understood what it means to face hostility. Don't become weary and discouraged in your souls, and you've not resisted to the point of bloodshed, striving against sin. That's a big deal here. You realize what Christ did? Christ Jesus, when he suffered, his, his sacrificial ministry of laying down his life was completely sinless. Can you imagine? Jesus says, I could call, I could call like regions of angels right now. I could shoot you people all down dead. Okay. That's really what he's saying. I could, I could just I could firebomb this place. I've got that much power. Stand by, I'm about to raise myself from the dead, is what he's really saying here. But he's saying, with all that he's enduring, all the hostility that he's facing, he's basically, he's enduring it with knowing that his mission is to accomplish something that needs to be accomplished. And no temptation from the wicked one was going to deter him. At one point, Jesus is literally shedding drops of like bloodlets, blood droplets from his forehead because he's just in agony, knowing not so much about the pain of the cross, but he's going to experience for the first time ever what it means to be utterly and totally separated from the Father. All of sin, all of it, every one of it, the stuff that just happened in Idaho, all of it, it's vileness, it's destructive, corrosive penetrating, horrible, the problem that's going on in this world right now, my Savior paid for that in full on that cross. And anyone who looks to him will be forgiven. He paid a debt that only he could pay. He paid it with his own precious blood. So when you're having a bad day, just remember, you are to come to him. Do not let Satan, Satan was throwing a bunch of lies at me yesterday, and I'm like, I'm telling my wife, I'm like, there's like a lot going on. I'm, I'm just, you know, 
I finally realized after I was studying, I'm like, you know what? I need to stay in this word. This is the way forward, right? Amen? Amen. Satan's going to throw lies at you from time to time too. He's usually going to pick on your weakness and where you're failed. Listen, you can make adjustments in your life. You'll never regret doing that. God will always reward you in some way, even if it's just a greater sense of his presence that you trusted me with this. And see what I did? And that's why I think when we learn to trust him, the next time a big one shows up, it's like, you know what, Lord? Huh. And if you're a journaler, you might want to look back on those pages to say, you know what? God was faithful. Like, do you remember that? I was there. I didn't understand how that was all going to work out. I journaled, made a few thoughts in the ear of God. So sometimes you just need to relive your own, uh, your own deliverance of God being faithful t- to you. And that's why scripture says here, my son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you, when you are rebuked by him. Whew. Scripture talks about the rebuke of a friend. Christ Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. If he's correcting you, it's because you need it and he loves you. That's, that's like, that's, that, you got to get good at like, practicing these things. Like, this is how it works. Like, I'm wrong. He's right. He's got something to teach me. And that's where you, um, you kind of want to, you know, get good. It's not comfortable. Scripture's very clear here. It's no, it's not comfortable. Sometimes you're going to get corrected by the Lord and it's going to hurt. And you may have to go humble yourself. You may have to say, you know what? I was completely wrong. I said the wrong thing to you. I am so sorry. And then you open that door for forgiveness. And this is where, this is what happens in our, in relationships. A lot of this stuff plays out in our families and people don't realize like, wow, there's a, there is a correct, a correct way of dealing with the problems in our families. And that is, um, following the way the scripture teaches us to deal with these difficult moments. When you're uncomfortable or something's not sitting, sitting with you quite right, just go before the Lord and say, Lord, what is it about this that I need to really trust you on? What could I go? To? Maybe there isn't something for you to do. Maybe it's just for you to just not do anything. Maybe you have a, a feeling in your spirit at that moment, I need to retaliate here. They need to know how mad I am. Sometimes I've blown it. I need to figure out what the right time is to make that thing right. And usually I look for it and see what I can do. And I never believe that Christians should be a doormat to abuse or verbal abuse or anything like that. I'm not promoting that. Sometimes you get away from people who are toxic because you know, like if you just keep hanging around them, they're, they're going to tear you down. I talked to a woman yesterday going through a very difficult time and she just wants to do the right thing before the Lord. It's like, this is hard. So we're going to pray for you. We're going to ask God to open up the right time for a conversation that needs to happen. And, and, and those are things that can be difficult to stay in situations sometimes that aren't getting any better. But also make sure that you're not just letting somebody just walk all over you or treat you so poorly or swear in your face or anything like that. You can say, I don't appreciate that and I'm not tolerating that. You know what? Usually that stuff begins to work. Uh, begins the, you know, that begins the process. This is what happens in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down. Sometimes people get so discouraged, you can see it in their posture. They just walk around. It's like they just look wounded. Strengthening those hands, sometimes just lifting them up. That's why a healthy local church can just be the right place to be. You know, I love you guys. You know, we're in the family of God together. This is, you got saved. I got saved. We're saved together. We're growing towards more like Christ and we're, we can't wait to be with him forever. And God's, God has that wonderful, he has our future planned and he knows what we're up against. So strengthen the hands which hang down and the, and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that you may, so what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Sometimes you and I need to take steps for our own healing and that's building yourself up in the grace of God. Pursue peace with all people. Do your best to make sure that, you know what, I'm not, I'm not trying to hold a big grudge here, you know? Um, and with holiness, without no one will see the Lord. The goal here without holiness is just to get everybody in the family together, lest any root of bitterness spring up and causes trouble and defiles many. Bitterness is a bad disease. It can destroy things so 
quickly. People are unhappy. And it uses the example of, of Esau here and what Esau did. And he just sold his birthright, could care less. And sometimes quick fixes in our life, whether we go there sexually, we go there some other inappropriate way. We try to get some need met. It's never worked. It's never the right thing. It's always the thing that winds up. I like what Javer and McGee says. There are many ways that God chastises us. Some of them are our own stupidity that we wind up like years later. He tells this story. I love this story. He's like a guy who got marvelously saved from alcohol. Now is, you know, he's, they're out one night after he spoke and they're in a restaurant and he's, you know, they asked, he's go, go, they're going around the table like one guy wants a milkshake, one guy wants this, they're not alcohol at that point, but they're going around and they're all picking. This guy takes either like water or seltzer water. And somebody says, why don't you have, a, why don't you have yourself like the, 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 the milkshakes that are offered here? He's like, no, because my, my bad behavior years ago burned out my stomach and now I can't even tolerate certain foods. So that's reaping and sowing. So sometimes people have health issues after their life that was lived before Jesus, and then they paid the price for that. So God doesn't always take away that stuff. It's not like you're instantly healed the moment that you ask Christ to save you. But what you can do is God's saying, you know what, I'm going to take all of your weakness, all of your pain, all of who you are, the things that are still kind of wrong in your life, and I'm going to use them for my glory. Amen? Amen. That's so sweet. So we all, and that's keeping yourself in the grace of God, moving all the way through here. And here, here's this big thing that's still coming for us. And we're going to hopefully get down to some of the nitty gritty in the book of Revelation. But part of the motivating future or the motivating you in your service to Jesus is recognizing what's coming. A, a healthy Christian learns Bible prophecy. In other words, this isn't, this isn't just it, okay? I'm living my whatever years you have here. And then all of a sudden you die and you go to heaven. That, that, is, that is a very limited view of what God has for you. God has for you to know now what's coming in your future and the things that God did in the past through Mount Sinai and, and with the Israelites and some of these dramatic moments of God shaking the mountain and declaring to them, this is the way. And you guys pay attention. I am holy. <laughs> You worship me the way that I'm instructing you. And that's what God did to the Israelites. And they were trembling. Moses like Moses had many moments of encountering the complete and total holiness of God coming off the mountain. The guy's like bright red. He's glowing. Like the holiness of God is so intense. And now we don't see so much of that in our day. But the, but the way God sees you as a Christian is holy holy like Jesus. When God sees his own dear son, Jesus Christ, he sees the believer through Christ like as righteous as Jesus is. Just grab onto this one. As righteous as Christ is, God imputes that righteousness to your account as a Christian. Like who's sufficient for this stuff? Like who's worthy? That is salvation. That's why the more you and I understand how much we really have going for us as Christians, no matter what this life kind of shoots at us, the arrows that Satan tries to get, everything going on in this crazy world right now, all the, all the heartbreak, the things, the scripture is very clear. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But never forget that you are never alone if you have Jesus. Amen? Amen. See to it that you do not refuse him. Verse 25, this corresponds with the last point here by anticipating our secure future. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Every believer should be living as I'm not going to refuse God. If God tells me to keep coming, I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep coming. What does that mean? You keep coming and to be nurtured on the, on the scripture that will save you from a wasted life. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promising yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. It's talking about the future millennial period that's coming upon the earth. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. And, of, and you, know what's, you know what this tribulation period is coming on the earth is all about? It's making things right for the Lord Jesus to return. It's giving this world one more opportunity to return repent. You want to talk about revival that's coming? It's coming during the tribulation period. That is the period that is now reserved for the greatest move of God on the earth because that time is do or die time. You either love Jesus 
or you, you either love him and die for him, or you deny him and go out into eternity. That's for the people that are heading into that tribulation period. Right now, you and I have this, if I can put it this way, it's not so uncomfortable here. It at times can be a little bit rough. I believe a lot of the things that we're seeing develop in our world with every bit of technology that's unfolding, I mean, the stuff that's happening in the moment is all preparation for a future leader called the Antichrist who wants to keep people from knowing the true Savior, Jesus Christ. And we want to make sure that we are not ignorant of the times. Think of those wise men who came from the east. We saw his star. In other words, they were familiar with things that would take place on the earth. There are things that will be taking place on the earth that you don't have to be ignorant about. You want to know them so well that they motivate your presence so that you can keep seeing Jesus clearly. Remember that he suffered for you. And remember that the best way to do this is to stay in his grace, to stay in the grace of God. And number three, by anticipating our secure future. Our future is bright with him. Amen. Even if at times it doesn't feel very bright, I tell you, he promised I go to prepare a place for you where I am, there you will be also. He's coming again. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together today. And Lord, I pray that we as a group of believers, according to Hebrews chapter 12, will be able to see clearly, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Father, I pray that your name would be glorified in this church. I pray, Lord, for anybody in this building, Lord, who just says, Jesus, I am asking you to help me to see more clearly than I have been. I've been bothered. I've been in pain. I've been struggling. And I just ask you, Father, to help me. And I pray for you right now. I pray for those of you who may be really feeling weighed down or discouraged in any way, shape, or form, that you would know that your Savior is alive and well and welcomes relationship with you because his blood was spilt to prove it. And don't argue it. I pray that you will receive him. Don't refuse him. Come and trust him. It's my prayer for you today. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness to us. We ask you to help us, Lord, grow in our faithfulness to you that you will never deny us the opportunity to come. Whosoever will may come, says the scripture. And that's my prayer, Lord, that we'll keep coming, keep receiving. And as we observe your table, even now, Father, that you would strengthen us, Father, by this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're going to close in a song.